Dave Warnock, dear friend of mine, somebody that I got a chance to meet a couple of years ago, and I've interviewed on camera, joins me here. Dave, thanks so much for coming, brother. Hey, Seth. Glad to be here, always. So, I hate to be the next guy to ask, how you doing? I saw <laughs> you at the American Atheist National Convention, Atlanta, Georgia, Mm -hmm. And I know that the disease you have, I want you to talk about your condition for those who are new to your story, but it, is the condition progressing? I don't know. Take me to square one and let's talk. Okay. Yeah, sure. I am. I'm curious what your observation was in Atlanta, because we had seen each other probably uh, 10 months ago when I came through Tulsa and we, we uh, did the, in fact, I watched back that, um, video you made of me that profile uh, back in June of last year and looked at the comments again and you know I always am one of the comments said hadn't something like hasn't Dave Warnock been dying out loud for 10 years <laughs> you know That's terrible like, will you die already That's terrible. Uh, but I think people kind of think um, and, and it's fair it's fair because no one knows how this disease goes and well again let, let me set you up brother the, yeah. what is the disease when were oh, you diagnosed for those who are new to your story you're right thank you yeah um it's als lou gehrig's disease more commonly known as and it's 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 a fatal disease it has no treatment and no cure i was diagnosed february 26 of 2019 so i've been living with that diagnosis for over three years i've been living with the disease about four years because i Looking back, I had symptoms long before I was diagnosed. I just didn't know what they were. Um, so when we first met, you, you know, I was obviously affected by it. But I'm curious if you were able to notice a difference a year later when you watch me walk and act. I mean, was it a jarring? I mean, be honest with me, because I, you I, know, I, that's is it's tough. I know. Well, I mean, if you were, to, if I were to speak objectively i noticed that you were having more difficult uh, a more difficult time moving from place to place your gait was a little more staggered you were walking slower i think probably the most pronounced difference was i think in your hands yeah. i know that when you were here last june we had a chance to be interviewed we also had dinner together i know that even eating food holding utensils was a challenge and it seemed that that had progressed so i mean just from my vantage it did look like a progression was taking place yes yeah. and I, i've i've seen other people who've you know, the people that are around me every day, um, Bevan and other people I see on a regular basis, it's not as noticeable when you're seeing someone on a, on a somewhat consistent basis. But when you go six months, 10 months, a year, and then you're around me again, you notice a difference because that's the progression. It takes some time to see the the result of the progression. But yeah, it is progressing and it's becoming more difficult to do the daily things of life. Um, and it will continue to, I've, it's been mostly in my arms for the first three years, but now walking is becoming more of a challenge. I can't walk long distances without resting. Um, the gait is kind of a, a hobble. Uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely coming for me. And, um, that's, that's the hard thing with this disease. People that see me on a screen like this don't see that. They don't see the effect of it because my voice is still fairly normal and my speech is not affected too much. I get hoarse when I talk a long time, but well, when you were on stage in Atlanta, yeah. you, I noticed you choked up a little bit as you were talking about your condition and sort of the finite nature of, of your condition, you know, and, and how you knew you were on the clock. So I guess my next question has to be about your emotional health, right? I mean, as you see the progression, Without being, I'm not trying to be, you know, sensationalistic, but I mean, you see the writing on the wall. Fair question. Yeah, do, how you doing? I talk about it. I do, I do a lot of public speaking, and and I talk about this a lot. I get a lot of Q and A, and um, and I don't mind talking about it. But when I do talk about it, it does become more real, if that if that's understandable, because you know, on a daily basis, Bevan and I talk all the time. We have to put. It's almost we're in denial. You can't get up every day and think, oh, my God, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. It, it will rack your brain. But when I do bring it front and center in a conversation or in a, in a talk, 
as part of a talk, then yeah, it it does affect me emotionally because I'm I'm aware that that my time is slipping away and the moments become all the more precious and the experience become all the more important. Do you find that people get like me, like when they're talking to you, do they become self-conscious? What questions do I ask? Do I mention your health? You know, I find myself sort of walking on eggshells. That happened a lot. Yeah, yeah, all the time. I try to, that's why I try to make, I try to diffuse it with humor. Um, I've found that if I'm able to joke about it and put some dying jokes in or death jokes or, uh, it, it does put people at ease a little more and I don't want people to be uncomfortable about it because it is a tough subject and they care about me and they don't want to see me die. And so, yeah, it's tough to talk about. Well, death's a weird subject in this country. I mean, Americans are crap about mm -hmm. the entire process of, you know, the, the finite nature of our lives. We, uh, you know, we often don't live well, but we certainly often don't die well, and we don't like to talk about it. And I get it to a degree. Uh, you're doing better than the doctors said you would do, right? I mean, again, without being morbid, but you oh, yeah. weren't supposed to still be with us, right? No, no. I, I uh, got diagnosed, and I started giving my shit away and selling things and traveling and thinking, you know, I've got a year or two at the most, so I'm going to make the most of it. And um, here I am. Three years later, still going strong, as it were. Not not strong, I shouldn't say, but I got you. Still very functional and very able to do a lot of the things. I'm busier than I've ever been in terms of what I do with dying out loud and traveling and speaking and writing and shows and you know I I, I love it. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm my doctor said I'm 95 percent. I'm better than than 95 percent of people with ALS. So if there's a silver lining. At, I've got it. Yeah, I'm, I am not disappointed that you have defined the odds. So with Dying Out Loud, which is kind of your thing, and Carpe the Fucking DM, which is the hashtag, you have been saying seize the day, seize the moments. What types of stuff have you been doing? Because I know you mentioned in your interview you flew the Grand Canyon in a helicopter and you went skydiving. Right. By the way, I've been invited skydiving. No freaking Say do it. No way. You'll thank, me later. You'll thank me later. When you were up there and they opened the door to the plane, yeah. did you stop and think, I cannot, I cannot for, I, as a force of will, I cannot make myself jump. Tell me it, that went through your mind. Cause I know that's what I'd be thinking. That is the moment. That is the critical moment when you're, you're, the door is open. Well, the door is always, it, it's not like a door. It's just like a side of the, a oh, part of okay. the plane is missing. And so it's there to look at the whole time. And then when you shuffle over to it and it's your turn and you, you don't really jump, you just kind of lean forward and there's a guy on your back. So you don't really have any choice at that point. <laughs> uh, but you, you lean out and you just, you're there and it's 15,000 feet to the ground. And it's, that's the moment of the rush, but it's also the moment of a little bit of panic, if I'm honest. Did it you feel a, like you were flying, or did you f always feel like you were falling? Oh, no. Well, the falling part is obviously before they open the chute. Um, but, yeah, it's a free fall, and your hair is, you know, flying, and your arm. It was funny for me, funny, morbid funny, but you're supposed to high-five the cameraman and Piece, you know, thumbs up, and I couldn't get my arms up. I still can't. <laughs> so I'm, I'm falling like a fish with my arms to my side and I just couldn't move them. Um, now you told me this over dinner and I don't think you said it in the interview, but I want you to relay it here. Once you guys pulled the chute, cause you weren't completely transparent with the skydive company about your condition no, before you jumped. Not let me. Yeah. Right. They would have said, sorry, you're disqualified. So you right. kind of were cagey about that. You played right. that close to the vest, but then they pulled the chute and you said what? Well, I told the guy, I said, listen, the, the reason I couldn't move my arms up is because I have ALS and it's affecting my arms and I don't have any strength in them. So that's just so you know, I wanted to, I couldn't get my arms up and he got emotional and he said, man, I'm, I, I hate to hear that. He said, I lost a friend to ALS and it became very personal to him as we were at that point, we're floating and we can talk when you're free falling, you can't talk to each other. It's just the rush of the wind past your ears but then we started having this conversation and he just said man i'm going to give you the ride of your life and we went we went off the course and and took a, a detour and bevan was watching from her 
parachute across the way. And she says, where are they going? What are they doing? And he said, here, he pulled my arm up. He said, let me let you steer it. And, you know, he just gave me some extras that not everybody gets because he had a personal connection to my disease. It was pretty poignant, a pretty poignant moment. And we got to the ground. We're loading up on the cart with all the other uh, flyers and uh, he let everyone know and it was kind of like I was the uh, guest of the day so to speak it was pretty pretty sweet time a pretty amazing human connection as you're sort of floating at you know 1500 yeah. feet yeah. and uh, enjoying sort of this um, view of the world that not and many people get to just, see so yeah it becomes a surreal moment where you just you really are flying then and you just feel like you know you see from a perspective you've never seen before and you're floating through the air and it's pretty pretty impressive so dave you wrote the book childish things mm -hmm. how'd you write it i mean physically how did you do are you Voice pecking text. at a keyboard did you dictate it what dictate yeah i used my ipad and every day i would go and and plug in my earphones and do i would dictate to uh, uh voice to text basically and then correct some of the words that I collaborated with my co-writer and we would go over what I'd written and correct some things, add some things, take some things out, fill some scenes out, some dialogue. And it was, uh, you know, once I got into the, you've written many books, you know what it's like. Once you get into the rhythm of it, you just get used to the schedule. And I would go every day to a coffee shop and, um, and get my words out and, you know, go through the process. But it was, I couldn't, type physically with my hands so it was a voice to text thing but it worked really a lot better than i thought it would so we get to see dave the uh the jesus freak hey the guy, we get to see dave the hardcore evangelical who had uh, was all in which is a fun part of the book not because you were brainwashed but just to try to picture in my mind that version of you Right. I mean, it's just a journey. It was amazing. Describe for those who haven't read the book, describe you as a Jesus freak, Dave. Well, the Jesus freak um, days, I kind of I kind of uh, chop it up into parts. The early life, the Jesus freak days in the mid 70s, early 80s, the bell bottoms, the cross around my neck, carrying a Bible everywhere I went. You don't you know, you just wouldn't go into a restaurant without your Bible. I mean, the the ludicrous uh, ideology of that is, you know, I look back at that and what the hell was I thinking? Was I going to have a Bible study in the restaurant? What was I thinking? But it was, uh, it was, it was just the image. You, you had an image to portray. And so that was a few years. And then I got married and became a family man. And I was on staff at several different churches as an associate pastor. And that a part of the book, I've had a lot of people tell me that's a part of the book they found fascinating, kind of behind the scenes of the inner workings of church and the politics and the the personalities and the stuff that goes on behind the curtain, if you will. And it's the dark underbelly of church business. Church is a business. And when you're in it and you're on staff, there's tithes, there's budget meetings, there's staff meetings. It's, it's not pretty. It's not, it's not uh, Jesus walking on a hill, you know, sharing with his disciples. It's, I mean, it's but there is some of that. Like I knew a guy, this is decades ago, but I mean, he walked around – he carried the Bible everywhere he went, and then he just wanted to bring the word. That's how he used to say it. Man, I just want to bring the word. And so you didn't want to be caught with this guy in an elevator or waiting on a, you know, I mean, he was not the dude that you would want to have to loiter yeah. with in an enclosed space because he was going to witness. And you just wanted to get the hell out of Hell, I was a believer, and I didn't want I to watch want to this. Funny, right. Were you that guy? Were you bringing no, the no. word, Dave? I wasn't that annoying. I, I really wasn't. I was I was very – people, in my view, people who are that way have a very low um, sense of awareness about them. They're not really uh, – they don't have the good social cues that this is not going well. This person is not liking what I'm saying. And that's really an obnoxious person that, that does that. I wasn't that guy. I was – I was more, I, in fact, I really, looking back, I, the process of writing the book was me essentially reliving my life and getting it out. And as I did that, I was revisiting these parts of my life that I'd long ago forgotten. And I remember thinking, wow, I was, I was not that evangelical guy. I was more of a people pastor person. You know, I, I, I used to berate myself because I wasn't winning as many souls as I would like to. 
And I was, I, I justified it by saying, well, I guess God's given me the gift of pastor teacher. You know, Ephesians talks about the gifts and different ones. And so I'm not the evangelist evangelist i'm the pastor teacher someone else gets them saved and then i get them mature in the lord kind of thing so i had all these ideas in my head about what god's gifting of for me was well i won't retell the story i want people to obviously uh, check out the book which i'll link in the description box but you go through we, we you and i have this in common right some things were not adding up right, right. this makes no sense Right. Did it take you a while to give yourself permission to explore that? Or did you do the whole, I don't have enough faith, it's an attack of Satan thing first? 35 years of that, Seth. It was one thing after another. Experiences that didn't add up, questions that didn't have answers. Like I've said many times, I believed in a God who was present and active and involved in our lives. He wasn't some distant deity that we didn't have interaction with. He answered prayers. He was showing us his will. He was speaking to us. And over and over again throughout my life, as I look back on it, and during my life, I remember thinking, this is not adding up. This is not what this is supposed to look like. But I would deep dive again. I would double down. I would ignore that. I would shove it in the background, and I would just plunge ahead because I had a lot invested at that point. And so that's kind of how you make sense of it as you go through the years it wasn't until late in life, after 37 years of that, or 35 or whatever, that I did allow myself and give myself permission to ask the hard questions that didn't have predetermined answers. Did you fear death when you were a believer in heaven? And I know right now you, you've you said, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I will. You <laughs> said uh, something along the lines of, um, you won't know that you didn't wake up, right, when you right. fall asleep. But when I was a devout believer, even though I thought I was going to the greatest place ever, 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 I was scared of death. Did that happen to you? I don't remember feeling fear of death. I don't remember feeling, um, thinking, oh my God, you know, I, I, I think I just never, it never was a part of my cognizant reality. It ne the, the idea of dying, I knew that, that I would die one day because we all do. But as a Christian, as an evangelical, Death is just a comma. You know, it, it, there's no finality to it. You just go to sleep and wake up in heaven with Jesus. That's the idea that we live with. And and so there's not a, there wasn't in me a fear of, of dying. I just, I was healthy, always healthy, always enjoyed life. And so I didn't have a lot of thoughts of death. It wasn't a part of my conscious thinking for whatever reason. I know some people do have more of that. I just didn't. I'm talking here with Dave Warnock. He is an author. He is a speaker. I'll call you an activist. Just a good guy who uh, said some interesting things when I saw you speak at the American Atheist National Convention. I think you were the final speaker of the convention before we went and did this big charity thing to feed 50,000 people. You know, right. this assembling of 50,000 meals, pretty amazing. But you were talking from the stage, and I want to hit it here because it's something that's been on my mind. And that is that we have this propensity to splinter and divide and squabble and bicker, especially online, right? And this isn't just us opposing somebody who's in our who's in the out group, somebody that we stand ideologically opposed to, but we turn on each other. And we seem to, in many cases, turn on each other over dumb shit. And I wondered if anybody else was having this conversation. Am I the only one bothered by it? And all of a sudden, you make it a focus of your speech. I'll just tee you up, Dave. What's this about? I mean, you've been obviously witnessing this in your own circles, right? Yes, I have. And I, I've, I've been troubled by it for some time. Um, I, I chose the, talk, the title of my talk that I, that I gave there and that I'm planning to give elsewhere throughout the rest of the year when I've got opportunity is Putting Away Childish Things. And I'm kind of playing off my book title, Childish Things, which comes off of the scripture, which we know in 1 Corinthians, as the former guy says, um, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I spoke like a child, and I understood like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And that was kind of me looking at my life journey and, and realizing that that as I, as I grew out of Christianity and put that aside, I was putting away childish things. That's kind of how I, I frame that. 
And more so, I've gotten concerned about the childishness of our behavior in our atheist slash secular community, if we can call it that. And by that, I mean childish thinking to me is binary. It's good and evil. It's black and white. It's I'm right and you're wrong. That is what evangelical Christianity plays in. That's the stock and trade. That is the currency. You are either saved or you're lost. You're right or you're wrong. And and what when we let go of that, we should come into as humans, as adults, as mature people, we should develop more of, of a free thinking mindset of uh, looking for uh, the the gray areas, the commonalities that we have, the nuance, if you will, of life and our conversations. And I've found too often in the secular community, I've become aware of this, as you mentioned, this bickering where we're not allowed to disagree on anything anymore. If you don't think like I think about any and every subject, then I'm going to call you out. I'm going to cancel you. I'm going to block you. I'm going to unfriend you. And like you said, it's mostly online because we can hide behind the anonymity of our keyboards and not have to have a dialogue with another human being face to face. That's the problem. We've got all these, uh, I want to say, anonymous keyboard warriors. They maybe aren't anonymous. They have a name and a profile, but they can sit at home and fire shots at one another and not have to inter- interact with another human being face to face. That's a real problem. And I think we have to address it. Or The problem with it, the reason I think we have to address it is because if we spend our time bickering over things that don't really matter, then we're not going to be engaged in the things that do matter, like helping women fight for reproductive rights and things like that that are happening all around us. But we're too busy bickering with one another about how what kind of language you use about this, that, or the other. It really needs to stop. I got to jump in here, if I may, for people sure. who are already preparing bit. their yeah. missives. We, you and I, are not saying that there aren't people that we encounter who we feel are doing great damage. Right? Absolutely. It's not that we're saying there aren't awful people doing awful things who must be publicly opposed. Yeah. And it's funny because I can say that out loud, and people will send me the angry email anyway. Right? Right. You know, the, Seth and Dave are saying we got to hold hands and sing "Kumbaya." With, with all racists and the Nazis, right. Yeah, yeah. No. And that's not at all what we're saying. But an example that you and I've spoken about, I've seen like the Jesus historicists versus the Jesus mythicists, right? Exactly. Which is, I think, an academic question about whether or not a real guy named Jesus existed. Interesting. But these conversations that I've been saying, they're not just about, well, what do you think? Or I disagree, or I strongly disagree. These people are just throwing shit at each other over the fence. And I'm like, there's more important work to be done here, is there not? You've seen this, right, Dave? Exactly. And and that's a good point. And I want to make sure that we, in this conversation, make that point very, very clear. We're not talking about someone who's overtly racist or a Nazi or whatever you want to label it, someone who's... Uh, sexually harassing women or assaulting women. Uh, those are things that we need to speak up about and, and call out, like you said. But we're talking about things that we disagree on that are not critical to what we're doing or what really matters. And that's where we get caught up in these arguments. And it, at the end of the day, do they really make that much difference? Whether Jesus existed or not as a real person is not going to affect anything about my life or the lives of those around me. So, Dave, um, let's put a punctuation mark on it, brother. Okay. You have, and I want people to read your story. Mm -hmm. I want people to take your journey. And more than that, I want them to feel the kind of inspiration that I feel. God, it sounds like a freaking Hallmark movie. But (laughs) but when I, I look at you, you know, how many days have I gotten up and I punched the clock, right? even doing what I love. But I mean, I, you know, I get up and I go through the day and I take care of all my obligations and the honeydews and I meet my deadlines and I let the dogs out and, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, that kind of thing. But I, I'm, I'm just sort of filling the hours. And when I look at you, I'm reminded, holy cow, I'm on the clock, right? Mm. 
And these moments will never come back again. This is a finite existence. I, there is no evidence for life 2.0, man. I, I, I need to not waste this life. And so I, I really want the audience to feel that and to, to hear your story and experience that. I don't know. You can say it better than me. Take me down that road of carpe the fucking diem, Dave Warnock. Well, I, I'm acutely aware that every one of us have obligations and responsibilities and schedules and deadlines. And I've, I've never said that we should just ignore all of that because people don't have the luxury of that. I do in some sense because there are lots of things that other people have to worry about that I just don't. You know, I don't I don't have to worry about what my retirement plan is going to look like because um, I don't I'm not really going to have to have one. I'm, I'm kind of in it right now, so to speak, but I'm I'm still active and busy and doing the things that I do. Um, but it's all up to me. It's about making sure that the moments count, that we don't miss them, that we don't get caught up in the mundane and the trivial and allow that to, to rob us from what's really important. And that goes back to what we were talking about with these these bickering conversations that people have are, what is that doing for anyone? And are you letting that rob you of getting involved in something that might make more of a difference for yourself or for someone else? I'm not saying you have to be some kind of a crusader for some mission and things. Just if you want to just enjoy yourself, enjoy the sunsets with a glass of wine and a cigar, if you like those kind of things. Um, Enjoy conversations. Spend time with the people that you care about. Don't get caught up in the stuff that doesn't matter, that's just going to, at the end of the day, not mean anything. And so that's kind of the, the gist of it. And me with uh, a clock out on the table and my deadline looming a, a bit more than most, it's it, it allows me and, and causes me to be more aware of what I'm doing with the time. I really don't like wasting a day. If I feel like at the end of the day I didn't get much done, and and by done I mean value, the day had value, I get really pissed at myself because I really think I don't have days to waste. They, they all are important. And so that's that's it for me. And looking for the big moments like skydiving or going on a cruise with friends, those are big things. But they're also little things where just a piece of music inspires me and I have a quiet moment either alone or with someone I love. Those are the things that matter in life. And that's that's what I've been talking about for three years. And that's what seems to resonate with people. I just get a lot, a lot of different messages. People that are reading the book have found a lot of inspiration in my story and and my journey. And I've I've taken a great deal of satisfaction in that because it means a lot to have that out there. Dave, you mentioned the cigar. Do you yeah. uh, do you do that all the time? <laughs> so, Natalie and I is an exp I don't know why I'm telling this story, but Natalie <laughs> and I years ago decided because uh, they opened a cigar shop over off the river about 20 minutes from here, and uh, for some reason we thought, you know what, let's just go experience that. Like, I'm not a smoker. I don't want to be a smoker. But what's it like to actually sort of puff on a cigar? So we walk through this massive cigar shop. We have no idea what we're looking at. <laughs> right? Because there's a ton of options. Hell, I thought wine was, uh, you know, those selections were hard. And cigars of all shapes and sizes. Okay. Where'd they come from? And they, the flavors and aromas. But So we ended up sort of uh, grabbing something at random. And we light it up on the river. So we're sitting on this bench and we're both just puffing on the cigar. Half of it ends up in my teeth. I just, <laughs> I was not a, I, I, that's probably my last cigar. But now I picture you, I picture you kicking it back and the sun is setting and, you know, there's music playing and you've just got your cigar and you're just totally chilling. So I think that's, that, that's cool. We got to you. You got to have one more with me, Seth. The next time we come to town, we're going to that, and you and me and Natalie and Bevan are going to have a cigar. Together. I mean, what would you recommend for a guy like me if you were to pick my cigar? What would it be? Well, th that's the problem. A lot of people who don't know what they're doing, they get a bad cigar, and they and they and the, or they get a cheap one, and then they smoke it wrong, and they think, "Oh, that's a horrible experience. I'll never do that again." Well, it's like you need a little lesson, you know. You gotta have, you gotta know what the hell you're doing. And so I would, you know, I would get a Dominican or a Nicaraguan, and it would be mild to medium, and you wouldn't have a big, it wouldn't have a big strong 
uh, kick to it because you don't want to just to and I you know people don't know what they're doing and they have a bad experience and they write it off. We went to uh, we were on a we were on a trip with some friends and we went to a, a cigar shop, an actual factory in Dominican Republic. When I say factory, people think of you know a big warehouse. It was a small place. These they're all small place. They're hand rolling cigars. And so we got to the tour, and we rolled cigars, and we got some fresh ones from him. And those are really, really cool experiences to see what that's like and, and to experience that. So, yeah, there's a lot to learn about. I can teach you many things. Oh, I, I'm looking forward to the mail on this one. <laughs> Seth and Dave ex- encouraging tobacco use and the inhalation of smoke to the detriment well, you of society. You, do, you, get a little, you get a little overdraft, but you don't inhale cigars. Just, it's a big just, difference. Just you saying. Know? I'm just saying. We uh, did it for oh, the okay. experience. I'm just I know. Um, what's your website? How do people find you and take the journey with you, my friend? DaveOutloud.org. It's not dying out loud. That was already taken. So it's DaveOutloud.org. And all the links to all my other stuff is on there. My YouTube show that we do every Monday night, you've been on that. Um, it's We had a great, great conversation, difficult conversation about abortion rights just this past Monday. Um, we talk about things like that. It's not just a call-in show with the atheist versus God debate. That's kind of yeah. not my lane, and that's been done better and more by other people. So we well, talked shit, about I, On my overlay, I've got DaveOutloud.com, but you're saying now, it's dot. We've got both. Okay. Um, got, yeah, both should get you there, but DaveOutloud.org is kind of the most current, up to, up to date. Okay. All right. I want to make sure I've got you there. Links in the description box, and uh, I'm just uh, so inspired by you, and I'm so glad to call your friends. My hope is, you know, this time next year, we have another conversation just like this one. Okay? Be my pleasure, and look forward to seeing you again. we got some conferences in common coming up so we'll get to see each other a lot this year that'll be great and all of those conferences listed at the thinking events dave always a pleasure my too friend